It's been a little while since I've done a dedicated video just talking about the progress of Vagabond, kind of where we're sitting with it, why it's a different type of a system and everything. So this video right here is, I guess, my sales pitch, I guess you could say, for Vagabond in its current state and how you can go pick up the early access right now over on the Land of the Blind storefront. Real quick right off the bat, Vagabond is a TTRPG that will run itself. Now, what do I mean by that? I am of the opinion that a lot of TTRPGs really just don't do a lot to help out the DM. And unfortunately, a lot of these systems, rather than address what might be some core problems with the, the game itself that could be causing these headaches, they're throwing a lot of supplements out there to try and fix this issue rather than address, okay, maybe it's something about the core that's causing this problem, right? So because I was starting out with a brand new system core, I thought that this was the kind of thing that I could try to tackle right off from day one. I always wanted Solo Vagabond to potentially be a thing, but I also felt like it was a, a good design sensibility to go with to say from day one, we're going to try to build it to do Solo, but we're always going to keep in mind that the guided play of, you know, having a GM or co-op play even uh, could be potentially a thing. So the ways in which I've done this are number one with the hero record, the way that the characters are even going to engage with the system itself all of the DCs that they're going to know that they need to hit will be right there on their character sheet. I'm doing this in what we call a rollover system. Um, if you're thinking about like D&D 5e or Pathfinder, those are what I would call roll high systems where you don't really know what you need to hit. You just know that if you roll a bigger number, you get a better result. And then we have the roll under systems like what we could say with Dragon Bane or some more classic D&D where the stat that you have right there is the thing that you're supposed to roll at or below with the dice in order to pass the check. I really like the change that happens like kind of psychologically here where I'm looking at my character sheet and I'm like, that's the thing I have to beat, not this number that that guy right there is going to set. And I don't know what that number is. So I'm always a little bit like, should I do this? Should I not? I, I don't really like that mental game that's going on. I think that that causes some adversarial DMing in D&D 5e or it could cause some tension that just honestly doesn't need to be there if we can address it in the system itself. So what I've done here is come up with a different calculation for Vagabond for all of these D20 checks. What you're going to be doing is rolling the D20 against the number that is set on your character sheet that is equal to 20 minus the applicable stat, which will wind up being doubled if you're trained in the thing. This is why in Vagabond, some of the lower numbers that are on your sheet actually mean that you're good at that thing. Because what we're doing here is setting a difficulty, not necessarily this is the number that represents your skill with the thing, right? These are difficulties on your sheet that you need to roll at or above in order to pass this thing. Whenever we do make a check, we're going to be rolling a d20. And if that d20 is at or above that number that is on our hero record, that means that we've succeeded. So crits are still a thing in the game. You're still critting on a 20. All that good business. What this means in Vagabond is that our math is going to be incredibly simple. We're handling all of that during character creation so we don't have to think about it while we're playing. What this also means, weirdly enough, is that we've actually had Vagabond kind of working with Choose Your Own Adventure books, which was totally out there. It's not really the intention, but just the fact that it did happen was like just a really funny accident. While games like D&D 5e were big inspirations for some of the things that you'll see in Vagabond, honestly, the one that got me the most like focused in on what the big system changes needed to be was... Into the Odd by Chris McDowell. Into the Odd is a game that challenged a lot of TTRPG conventions. I know some people like to lump this in with a lot of the OSR style games like Cairn or you could say like White Box or something like that. Um, this is not exactly what I would call an OSR style game. And this was one of the games that I think was doing a lot of design from reduction that helped inspire a lot of what I'm doing with Vagabond. And I can't help but talk about the other inspiration, the gateway drug that led to me getting into this one, and that is Merkborg by Paley Nielsen and Johan Noor. This is the game that just, it knows what it's about. Um, I, I like so much of what was happening with Merkborg, but if we were to say that like, okay, well, Taryn, why don't you just play Merkborg or Into the Odd instead? I wanted the sort of character expression that you get out of more modern TTRPGs. And I wanted a bit more to like kind of bite into in terms of some rulings for the systems. And I couldn't help it. I, I have an idea for a magic system that we'll get into here in a second that nothing is really supporting. 
I mean, why does anybody make a game? They're inspired to make a game, right? Like, just like, like let's make games to make games because they're fun. So currently, what is Vagabond offering for you? Uh, number one, we have, I think it's like either 18 or 19 classes. It depends on what you consider the Vagabond itself to be. It is sort of a Build-A-Bear class. So if you just want like a perk tree class, there you go. The other classes include, I'm reading off of the table of contents here right now, the Alchemist, Barbarian, Bard, Cleric, Dancer, Druid, Fighter, Gunslinger, Hunter, Magus, Pugilist, Revelator, Rogue, Sorcerer, Vanguard, Witch, and Wizard. So yes, this is a bigger class portfolio here. Yeah, I wanted more. I like more character options. I come from a background in JRPGs, so like, I love the idea of more, more stuff on my palette to kind of paint what my character is. Ancestry wise, we have the human, dragonkin, dwarf, the elf. Right now we have three different elves with the empathetic, stellar, and wild elf. The orc, the wee folk, which is covering the halfling gnome and the kabooter. The beast folk, which is covering a huge palette of different beasts. Uh, the changeling fiends, which are going to be the demonic, the netherian, and the ominic fiends. The golem, and then the acid, air, earth, flame, frost, and water kindled. So there's 20 ancestries right there. I think I might've gotten the math on that right, but there are also additional ancestries in the bestiary if you wanna play a monster in Vagabond. So we can start in a bit on the crunch here, but I just sort of wanna highlight it rather than get into that with this video here. I'll make more videos kind of going into depth on my thoughts on that later on. But as for right now, your stats, we don't have modifiers in the system. This is just gonna be on a scale of one to 10. How good are you at the thing? because your character will max out at eight and the lowest that they can be in a thing is going to be a two, right? So two represents like baseline human capability, eight representing like the best you can possibly do as a mortal. And this is a six stat system. We have might, dexterity, awareness, logic, presence, and luck. Uh, luck is gonna be an odd duck here. If you played a system like Merkborg, it's probably gonna feel kind of familiar because they use omens over there. And I think the two do have a little bit of rub, but they do have a different narrative niche that we're hitting here. Your might determines your vigor die, which feels a bit like hit dice from other games. You have your maximum health, your load, your brawn skill, and brawn is the way that we're handling things like punching, shoving, grappling, yada, yada, yada. We have dexterity. Dexterity is how we're going to calculate your base speed. That's not based off of a race or anything like that. It is for finesse checks and sneak checks as well. We also have the awareness stat, which is sort of a measure of your cognition and perception. Awareness is going to be used for detect, mysticism, survival, and vibe checks. Your logic skill will be used for arcana, the craft skill, examine, lore, and medicine. Presence describing your overall magnetism, charisma, and wit. This is going to affect influence and performance checks for the most part in Vagabond. I'm trying not to gamify social interactions here because I would like to encourage people to roleplay by not putting dice checks on every single like sentence or anything. So we've removed a bit of that and the influence check is supposed to be a bit more mechanically defined as something that you'll be able to like command or parlay characters with, not necessarily how easy it is for you to persuade something. And then with luck, this is going to give you a die size kind of similar to hit die in a way, but what this luck die is doing is you can roll this die at the start of every day in order to get a number of luck points. And you can spend these luck points to do things like favor someone's roll. Favor is like advantage, disadvantage from 5e. Clutch, uh, this is re-rolling your last roll before it resolves. And then super effective, you just max out a damage or healing roll that you made. Okay, defenses. This is where we get a little bit odd here. You don't become trained in defenses like you would with saving throws because what we're doing here is a little bit different. Your defense is going to be 20 minus two applicable stats. So for dodge, we have 20 minus your dexterity plus your awareness. For endure, we have 20 minus double your might. For will, we have 20 minus presence plus logic. Uh, might is representative of not just your physical prowess, but also your health and your overall state of being, right? So if we're combining strength and constitution into one stat, that's why Endure is getting this doubled up thing right here. I've never, as a designer, been a big fan of the power budget that you have to spend on giving people saving throw proficiencies in games like 5e. I just feel like this is a thing that if we know that this is required, it should synergize 
with what you're already doing as a character in a way. So if you're prioritizing the stats that are shown here in these defenses, naturally as a part of you building like a high dex rogue, you will just naturally become better with dodge. So on the enemy turn, what's winding up happening is enemies are always assumed to hit. This is another part of making the system a bit easier for GMs to run. So that's where you as a character have to step in and prove that you did dodge the thing. You willed your way through this mental effect that was taxing your mind. You did endure this poison that they subjected you to, uh, whatever. Now, what this wound up doing is just naturally, all of these attacks were targeting dodge. Any physical claw, bite, whatever was just, it was always, always, always hitting dodge. And that didn't feel great, especially on like hyper tank options where, you know, I'm the guy that made the Vanguard. I want to make the Vanguard feel good. And it felt weird that this character who was like kind of encouraging, yes, hit me, was always being asked to make a check for a thing that they were like, well, I kind of want to fail that. So what I did instead, this is kind of a good segue over to our weapon section here. In Vagabond, if you're subjected to an effect that makes you make a dodge check, you can instead make a check with your shield. Now, this attack is going to hit you, but the idea should be that your shield is going to be a thing that will negate the damage. All shields come with a die that allows you to reduce the damage by what's shown. You can also attack with them, and we have three different shield varieties right now with the parrying shield, the standard shield, and the great shield. So as a result of that, no, you did not hear me wrong. Shields are considered a weapon over here. They do have properties attached to them. They're not handled as an armor like with what you will see with 5e. They do have their own sort of interaction here in the game that I feel like makes them a bit more interesting. Uh, gives you a, more of a tactical decision that you're making here rather than this is a passive bonus here until I equip something else. Armor in this system is not helping you to evade. It's helping you to mitigate damage. So... If you're wearing light armor, you have an armor rating of one. If you're wearing heavy armor, you have an armor rating of two. So anytime that you take physical damage, you are going to reduce that damage by the amount that's shown right there for your armor. And then if you have a shield, you can also negate some of the damage that way. And we do have two separate forms of protection here. Armor is only blocking out physical attacks and damage and such, whereas resist is blocking out some of the more magical effects or I guess you could just say energy based effects. The way that both of these work is you're going to see a number beside the indicated damage type. For armor, it's just all physical. Resist is going to be the damage type that's indicated. That number is going to be how much you reduce any of the damage you take by. And then if it has an I right next to it, it just means you're immune to it. All right, so let's talk about the action economy and the combat system real quick. Now, Vagabond, there's no initiative. We are handling things with group versus group. Uh, the individual initiative systems have always caused a bog down of play. Once we got rid of this and we started using group initiative, man, combat just sped up. It, it is crazy how quick we get through combat in this system. I'm trying not to use the TTRPG buzzword of snappy here, but it, it, I wouldn't even say snappy. That's not the right word. It's fluid. This combat is supposed to flow seamlessly during all the interesting exploration aspects of the game. And if combat breaks out, it's not supposed to feel like suddenly we have a loading screen and then we're in combat. There is no initiative. It is just straight up your turn or the enemy's turn. This is how we handle this. And in combat, what you can do, you can take a main action, a quick action, and move, all right? You can split up this move at any points in like before or after your main action. And then with the quick action, this is a thing that, <laughs> I tried to do something that was a bit odd here, okay? Uh, your quick action, if you think about like a system like D&D, &D, right, where I get a lot of my roots from, D&D has the bonus action and the reaction. This is something that I think is just not really necessary to the game. Uh, I think that both of these are aspects of evoking a particular play style that you can also get across by just combining them. So while the main action is a thing that must be taken on your group's turn, a quick action is a thing that you can take either on your group's turn or on the enemy turn. So the main actions that are in here are attack, cast, defend, help, hold, rush, and use. Quick actions include the counter, which is going to feel a bit like an opportunity attack, maneuvering, allowing you to drop prone or jump, the quick cast, which is going to have a special interaction going on with the brand new magic system for Vagabond that we'll talk about here in just a second, speak, saying five or more words or giving commands. I wanted to put a bit more mechanical weight on things like what a, a beast master could be in this system or a commander like a warlord so we made sure that that was going to be 
part of the action economy. And then the withdraw quick action is much like disengage where you're not provoking counters for the rest of the turn that you use that on. We went on ahead, made that a quick action for everybody because it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to eat up power budget for this one specific interaction to be required for a particular play style. Another aspect I'm very, very focused on is making exploration very interesting. In Vagabond, what you're going to see is we have an infinite world generator already built in here to where you can make a hex crawl by yourself, go and explore that world. We're still working on some of the aspects of it, like the random encounters that you would find, some of the like landmarks or whatever that you're going to find in the world. But the cool thing right now is that if you have a hex crawl map, like one of the maps from Dyson Logos, you can just literally make a hex crawl world, plug that one in somewhere out there in the world and walk to that hex crawl with the world generation rules that I've given you making an earth like terrain world. The fact that this is a thing that we had plugged in is just absolutely mind blowing to me. I'm so happy to have gotten this thing working. It does work. We're just currently filling it up with content. I, I can't wait for people to get a hold of this. As a result of it, what it's going to mean is like Vagabond doesn't have a default world. All worlds are going to feel a bit like Minecrafty procedural generation. If you wanted to go in that route or if you don't have a campaign setting built into it, this will adapt to any world. If you want to plug it into Vagabond, very, very easy. You want to take a chunk out of like Italy and just throw it into your world with a hex crawl. You, you can and it will fill in the terrain as you go along and explore this world. I'm. I'm so happy with this engine, you guys have no idea. <laughs> While we're talking about exploration, I am also working on some of the dungeon crawl rules here. Uh, one of the ones in particular is using progress clocks from systems like Blades in the Dark to make it to where threat feels a bit more present, especially in solo play. There's also the quest countdown die mechanic to make things feel a bit more dynamic. And there is a dungeon in the alpha play test that you can go play right now that has these rules all present. Um, you can see the system running itself that will create a procedurally generated dungeon crawl for you to play with the system with any character you make. The resting rules have additional benefits for if you take care of your character, if you do things like cooking, whatever, you do get more benefits out of the rest. This isn't necessarily a big game of attrition here. Uh, short rests are going to be 10 minutes. I just really disagree with the idea that the way that you make some of these games challenging is by taking toys away from characters as they're going through these things. I never agreed that a TTRPG should be a resource manager. I think that it should be an action game first and foremost. So that's what we're going with. We're making an action game. So here is the big showpiece. I'm sure the whole drum roll that's led up to this rem shot here, the magic system. All right. So the magic system that I've developed is inspired by games like neoclassical geek revival, where I wanted you to feel like you are able to customize a spell it, it never made a whole lot of sense to me in something like D&D, &D, where if I know Firebolt, I can't just make a small flame in my hand just for narrative purposes. It always has to be the specific thing, right? So instead, I like the idea that a mage should feel more like if you've ever seen Castlevania, like Sypha Belnatus, right? Where rules aren't so hyper-specific on what that spell can do. There are different things that you can do to sort of customize it and make it feel more flexible to you. Now, a part of that is, while I just said I'm not a big fan of Vancey and Magic, I am a fan of a particular spell called Prestidigitation. What I love about Prestidigitation is just like it's an open invitation for you to be as creative with the magic as you want to be, right? Like, uh, I don't know, I've got a card up my sleeve, right? Oh, okay, cool. Well, now what do you know? That card is actually bent, right? It, it, whatever. The card is now a Rubik's Cube. Woo! I wanted every spell in Vagabond to feel like an invitation for you to get creative with it, like Prestidigitation does for 5e players. So as a result of that, Vagabond uses a mana system. You will get an amount of mana per long rest as shown for your class. So a lot of these are getting ones like the mana is equal to the casting stat plus your, let's say, wizard level doubled or something like that, and you get it back on a long rest. And what you can do with these is you can change the basic casting action in a way. 
By default, all magic is going to be using the cast action. This is a main action, right? And it's going to require gestures and incantations, and it's only going to do either damage or an effect. This is an either-or situation here. Uh, and they can be cast with a delivery. This is like how you're manifesting it, right? As either touch or bolt or remote, right? So this is touch. I go up and touch something, and then, whoo, I affect it with the magic, right? I can launch a bolt of this magic at them as like some sort of a missile or remote is just if I can see them, okay, I can affect them with it, right? So that's the delivery of it right there. And then all magic is instantaneous unless you begin focusing on it. Now, focus is going to feel a bit like concentration, but you're not going to be making checks to focus um, as a result of taking damage. This is just a thing that makes sure that you're only doing one of these things that you can focus on at a time in the system. Yes, that means concentration checks are gone for the most part. Uh, you will still need to make a check to make sure that you can maintain the effect at the start of each of your group's subsequent turns after you begin focusing on it. All spells are assumed to just do d6s of damage, so if you're doing 1d6 with the damage and you want to up that, all you've got to do is spend one mana to keep increasing the damage on there. If you want to change the area, let's say that you want to make the delivery a spear or a cube or you want to imbue a sword with an effect, or I, I don't know, you want to make a glyph of magic down on the ground, we have rules for how you can do all of that. If you want to make a spell silent, if you want to quick cast it, right, this should feel like everybody gets a little bit of meta magic here, because that's just an intrinsic part of spell casting. I love the cinema of what this has done, where people don't feel like they are specifically always casting this one spell to do this one thing, they can do, like, if I take the flame essence, I sure, I can make fireball. I can also make, I don't know, fire sword or whatever. Everything should feel, if you're really into that prestidigitation style play, come check this thing out. I feel like this is going to be an incredibly long video, so I'm going to end this here. Um, I'm just letting you all know that if you go and pick this one up, it is in early access, which means that some of the elements of it are not quite complete yet. There are spots where people are discovering some kind of holdover text from earlier stuff that was going on that isn't really updated for some changes. But the cool thing is that right now, the system is from first to 10th level playable, right? So you can do a campaign in Vagabond. There are people already doing that out there right now. So if you want to go get it on the early access, the Land of the Blind storefront should be down in the description down below. Should be a card, all that good business. I appreciate any support as I'm like trying to get this thing out there. If you already have Vagabond and you want to show additional support, my Patreon is available here at the end as well. And thank you to all my Patreon sponsors for helping me keep the lights on around here and coffee in my blood. Y'all are absolute heroes. Uh, we're going to be getting louder with this system as time keeps going on. I'm going to get some actual plays kind of going and uh, talk a bit more as we get updated. But yeah, guys, uh, here we are. It is, what, eight, nine months after I said that I was going to start this thing. And... Uh, yeah, we got a game.